Jomo Kenyatta was a Kenyan anti-colonial activist and politician who governed Kenya as its Prime Minister from 1963 to 1964 and then as its first President from 1964 to his death in 1978. He was the country's first indigenous head of government and played a significant role in the transformation of Kenya from a colony of the British Empire into an independent republic. Ideologically an African nationalist and conservative, he led the Kenya African National Union Kenyu, party from 1961 until his death. Kenyatta was born to Kikuyu farmers in Kimbu, British East Africa. Educated at a mission school, he worked in various jobs before becoming politically engaged through the Kikuyu Central Association. In 1929, he traveled to London to lobby for Kikuyu land affairs. During the 1930s, he studied at Moscow's Communist University of the Oilers of the East, University College London, and the London School of Economics. In 1938, he published an anthropological study of Kikuyu life before working as a farm laborer in Sussex during the Second World War. Influenced by his friend George Padmore, he embraced anti-colonialist and pan-African ideas, co-organizing the 1945 Ban-African Congress in Manchester. He returned to Kenya in 1946 and became a school principal. In 1947, he was elected president of the Kenya African Union, through which he lobbied for independence from British colonial rule, attracting widespread indigenous support but animosity from white settlers. In 1952, he was among the Cape and Guria Six arrested and charged with masterminding the anti-colonial Momo uprising. Although protesting his innocence, a view shared by later historians, he was convicted. He remained imprisoned at Lakatong until 1959 and then exiled in Lodwar until 1961. On his release, Kenyatta became president of Kanyu and led the party to victory in the 1963 general election. As prime minister, he oversaw the transition of the Kenya colony into an independent republic of which he became president in 1964. Desiring a one-party state, he transferred regional powers to his central government, suppressed political dissent, and prohibited Kenya's only rival, Ojinga Odinga's leftist Kenya People's Union, from competing in elections. He promoted reconciliation between the country's indigenous ethnic groups and its European minority, although his relations with the Kenyan Indians were strained and Kenya's army clashed with Somali separatists in the northeastern province during the Shifta War. His government pursued capitalist economic policies and the Africanization of the economy, prohibiting non-citizens from controlling key industries. Education and healthcare were expanded while UK-funded land redistribution favored Kenya loyalists and exacerbated ethnic tensions. Under Kenyatta, Kenya joined the Organization of African Unity and the Commonwealth of Nations, espousing a pro-Western and anti-communist foreign policy amid the Cold War. Kenyatta died in office and was succeeded by Daniel Arab Ma. Kenyatta was a controversial figure. Prior to Kenyan independence, Many of its white settlers regarded him as an agitator and malcontent, although across Africa he gained widespread respect as an anti-colonialist. During his presidency, he was given the honorary title of Mzi and lauded as the father of the nation, securing support from both the black majority and white minority with his message of reconciliation. Conversely, his rule was criticized as dictatorial, authoritarian, and neocolonial, of favoring Kikuyu over other ethnic groups, and of facilitating the growth of widespread corruption. Early Life A member of the Kikuyu people, Kenyatta was born in the village of Njinda. Birth records were not then kept among the Kikuyu, and Kenyatta's date of birth is not known. One biographer, Jules Archer, suggested he was likely born in 1890 although a fuller analysis by Jeremy Murray Brown suggested a birth circa 1897 or 1898. Kenyatta's father was named Nugai, and his mother Wambui. They lived in a homestead near the river Thirarika, where they raised crops and bred sheep and goats. Nugai was sufficiently wealthy that he could afford to keep several wives, each living in a separate Anumba, woman's hut. Kenyatta was raised according to traditional Kikuyu custom and belief, and was taught the skills needed to herd the family flock. 
When he was 10, his earlobes were pierced to mark his transition from childhood. Wambui subsequently bore another son, Congo, shortly before Mugai died. In keeping with Kikuyu tradition, Wambui then married her late husband's younger brother, Njinji. Kenyatta then took the name of Kamwa Wan Shinji, Kama, son of Njinji. Wambui bore her new husband a son, whom they also named Mugai. Njinji was harsh and resentful toward the three boys, and Wambui decided to take her youngest son to live with her parental family further north. It was there that she died, and Kenyatta, who was very fond of the younger Mugai, traveled to collect his infant half-brother. Kenyatta then moved in with his grandfather, Kongo Wamagana, and assisted the latter in his role as a traditional healer. In November 1909, Kenyatta left home and enrolled as a pupil at the Church of Scotland Mission CSM, at the Godo. The missionaries were zealous Christians who believed that bringing Christianity to the indigenous peoples of Eastern Africa was part of Britain's civilizing mission. While there, Kenyatta stayed at the small boarding school, where he learned stories from the Bible, and was taught to read and write in English. He also performed chores for the mission including washing the dishes and weeding the gardens. He was soon joined at the mission dormitory by his brother Congo. The longer the pupils stayed, the more they came to resent the patronizing way many of the British missionaries treated them. Kenyatta's academic progress was unremarkable, and in July 1912 he became an apprentice to the mission's carpenter. That year, he professed his dedication to Christianity and began undergoing catechism. In 1913, he underwent the Kikuyu circumcision ritual. The missionaries generally disapproved of this custom, but it was an important aspect of Kikuyu tradition, allowing Kenyatta to be recognized as an adult. Asked to take a Christian name for his upcoming baptism, he first chose both John and Peter after Jesus' apostles. Forced by the missionaries to choose just one, he chose Johnston, the stone chosen as a reference to Peter. Accordingly, he was baptized as Johnston Kamwa in August 1914. After his baptism, Kenyatta moved out of the mission dormitory and lived with friends. Having completed his apprenticeship to the carpenter, Kenyatta requested that the mission allow him to be an apprentice stonemason, but they refused. He then requested that the mission recommend him for employment, but the head missionary refused because of an allegation of minor dishonesty. Nairobi 1914 to 1922 Kenyatta moved to Thika, where he worked for an engineering firm run by Britain John Cook. In this position, he was tasked with fetching the company wages from a bank in Nairobi, 25 miles away. Kenyatta left the job when he became seriously ill, he recuperated at a friend's house in the Tumiyuma Presbyterian Mission. At the time, the British Empire was engaged in the First World War and the British Army had recruited many Kikuyu. One of those who joined was Congo, who disappeared during the conflict, his family never learned of his fate. Kenyatta did not join the armed forces, and like other Kikuyu he moved to live among the Maasai, who had refused to fight for the British. Kenyatta lived with the family of an aunt who had married a Maasai chief, adopting Maasai customs and wearing Maasai jewelry, including a beaded belt known as Kenyatta in the Kikuyu language. At some point, he took to calling himself Kenyatta or Kenyatta after this garment. In 1917, Kenyatta moved to Nruk, where he was involved in transporting livestock to Nairobi, before relocating to Nairobi to work in a store selling farming and engineering equipment. In the evenings, he took classes in a church mission school. Several months later he returned to Thika before obtaining employment building houses for the Thigoda mission. He also lived for a time in Dagarati, where he became a retainer for a local sub-chief, Kia. In 1919 he assisted Kia in putting the latter's case in a land dispute before a Nairobi court. Desiring a wife, Kenyatta entered a relationship with Grace Wa U, who had attended the CMS school in Kabat. She initially moved into Kenyatta's family homestead, although she joined Kenyatta in Dagarati when Jengji drove her out. On November 20, 1920 she gave birth to Kenyatta's son, Peter Mugui. In October 1920, Kenyatta was called before the Thigoda Kirk session and suspended from taking Holy Communion. The suspension was in response to his drinking and his relations with Wairat of wedlock. 
the church insisted that a traditional Kikuyu wedding would be inadequate, and that he must undergo a Christian marriage. This took place on November 8, 1922. Kenyatta had initially refused to cease drinking, but in July 1923 he officially renounced alcohol and was allowed to return to Holy Communion. In April 1922, Kenyatta began working as a store's clerk and meter reader for Cook, who had been appointed water superintendent for Nairobi's Municipal Council. He earned 250 shillings a month, a particularly high wage for a native African, which brought him financial independence and a growing sense of self-confidence. Kenyatta lived in the Kilimani neighborhood of Nairobi, although financed the construction of a second home at Dagarati. He referred to this latter hut as the Kenyatta stores for he used it to hold general provisions for the neighborhood. He had sufficient funds that he could lend money to European clerks in the offices, and could enjoy the lifestyle offered by Nairobi, which included cinemas, football matches, and imported British fashions. Personality Ever a showman, Kenyatta, could appear one moment in gaily colored shirts, decorated with the cock of Kenyu, and the next in elegant suits from Civil Row, seldom without a rose in his buttonhole, he could be photographed in leopard skin hat and cloak waving a silver fly whiskor and old slacks on his farm tending his shrubs, he was equally at home in academic robes at a university function and in sandals and shorts on the beach at Mombasa. African exuberance and love of display found perfect expression in Kenyatta's flair alongside the dignity and respect due to His Excellency, the President, Msi Jamu Kenyatta. Kenyatta biographer Jeremy Murray Brown Leadership Premiership, 1963-1964 The May 1963 general election pitted Kenyatta's Kenu against Kadu, the Akamba People's Party, and various independent candidates. Kenu was victorious with 83 seats out of 124 in the House of Representatives, a Kenu majority government replaced the pre-existing coalition. On June 1, 1963, Kenyatta was sworn in as Prime Minister of the Autonomous Kenyan Government. Kenya remained a monarchy, with Queen Elizabeth II as its head of state. In November 1963, Kenyatta's government introduced a law making it a criminal offense to disrespect the Prime Minister, exile being the punishment. Kenyatta's personality became a central aspect of the creation of the new state. In December, Nairobi's Delamere Avenue was renamed Kenyatta Avenue, and a bronze statue of him was erected beside the country's National Assembly. Photographs of Kenyatta were widely displayed in shop windows, and his face was also printed on the new currency. In 1964, Oxford University Press published a collection of Kenyatta's speeches under the title of Harambee. Kenya's first cabinet included not only Kikuyu but also members of the Wo, Kamba, Kisei and Marigali tribal groups. In June 1963, Kenyatta met with Julius Nyerere and Ugandan President Milton Obote in Nairobi. The trio discussed the possibility of merging their three nations, plus Zanzibar, into a single East African federation, agreeing that this would be accomplished by the end of the year. Privately, Kenyatta was more reluctant regarding the arrangement and as 1964 came around the federation had not come to pass. Many radical voices in Kenya urged him to pursue the project. In May 1964, Kenyatta rejected a backbencher's resolution calling for speedier federation. He publicly stated that talk of a federation had always been a ruse to hasten the pace of Kenyan independence from Britain, but Nyerere denied that this was true. Continuing to emphasize good relations with the white settlers, in August 1963 Kenyatta met with 300 white farmers at Nikuru. He reassured them that they would be safe and welcome in an independent Kenya, and more broadly talked of forgiving and forgetting the conflicts of the past. Despite his attempts at wooing white support, he did not do the same with the Indian minority. Like many indigenous Africans in Kenya, Kenyatta bore a sense of resentment towards this community, despite the role that many Indians had played in securing the country's independence. He also encouraged the remaining Momo fighters to leave the forests and settle in society. Throughout Kenyatta's rule, many of these individuals remained out of work, unemployment being one of the most persistent problems facing his government. 
A celebration to mark independence was held in a specially constructed stadium on December 12, 1963. During the ceremony, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, representing the British monarchy, formally handed over control of the country to Kenyatta. Also in attendance were leading figures from the Momo. In a speech, Kenyatta described it as the greatest day in Kenya's history and the happiest day in my life. 308, he had flown Edna and Peter over for the ceremony, and in Kenya they were welcomed into Kenyatta's family by his other wives. Disputes with Somalia over the Northern Frontier District, NFD, continued, for much of Kenyatta's rule, Somalia remained the major threat to his government. To deal with sporadic violence in the region by Somali shifty guerrillas, Kenyatta sent soldiers into the region in December 1963 and gave them broad powers of arrest and seizure in the NFD in September 1964. British troops were assigned to assist the Kenyan army in the region. Kenyatta also faced domestic opposition. In January 1964, sections of the army launched a mutiny in Nairobi, and Kenyatta called on the British army to put down the rebellion. Similar armed uprisings had taken place that month in neighboring Uganda and Tanganyika. Kenyatta was outraged and shaken by the mutiny. He publicly rebuked the mutineers, emphasizing the need for law and order in Kenya. To prevent further military unrest, he brought in a review of the salaries of the army, police, and prison staff, leading to pay rises. Kenyatta also wanted to contain parliamentary opposition and at Kenyatta's prompting, in November 1964 Kidu officially dissolved and its representatives joined Kenyu. Two of the senior members of Kidu, Ronald Ngala and Daniel Arab Ma, subsequently became some of Kenyatta's most loyal supporters. Kenya therefore became a de facto one-party state. Presidency, 1964-1978 In December 1964, Kenya was officially proclaimed a republic. Kenyatta became its executive president, combining the roles of head of state and head of government. Over the course of 1965 and 1966, several constitutional amendments enhanced the president's power. For instance, a May 1966 amendment gave the president the ability to order the detention of individuals without trial if he thought the security of the state was threatened. Seeking the support of Kenya's second largest ethnic group, the Wo, Kenyatta appointed the Wo Ojinga Odinga as his vice president. The Kikuyu, who made up around 20% of population, still held most of the country's important government and administrative positions. This contributed to a perception among many Kenyans that independence had simply seen the dominance of a British elite replaced by the dominance of a Kikuyu elite. Kenyatta's calls to forgive and forget the past were a keystone of his government. He preserved some elements of the old colonial order, particularly in relation to law and order. The police and military structures were left largely intact. White Kenyans were left in senior positions within the judiciary, civil service and Parliament, with the white Kenyans Bruce Mackenzie and Humphrey Slade being among Kenyatta's top officials. Kenyatta's government nevertheless rejected the idea that the European and Asian minorities could be permitted dual citizenship, expecting these communities to offer total loyalty to the independent Kenyan state. His administration pressured whites-only social clubs to adopt multiracial inner policies and in 1964 schools formerly reserved for European pupils were open to Africans and Asians. Kenyatta's government believed it necessary to cultivate a united Kenyan national culture. To this end, it made efforts to assert the dignity of indigenous African cultures which missionaries and colonial authorities had belittled as primitive. An East African Literature Bureau was created to publish the work of indigenous writers. The Kenya Cultural Center supported indigenous art and music, and hundreds of traditional music and dance groups were formed. Kenyatta personally insisted that such performances were held at all national celebrations. Support was given to the preservation of historic and cultural monuments, while street names referencing colonial figures were renamed and symbols of colonialism, like the statue of British settler Hugh Coleman-Dilly, 3rd Baron Delamere in Nairobi City Center were removed. The government encouraged the use of Swahili as a national language, 
Although English remained the main medium for parliamentary debates and the language of instruction in schools and universities, the historian Robert M. Maxson nevertheless suggested that no national culture emerged during the Kenyatta era, most artistic and cultural expressions reflecting particular ethnic groups rather than a broader sense of Kenyanness, while Western culture remained heavily influential over the country's elites. Economic Policy Independent Kenya had an economy heavily molded by colonial rule, agriculture dominated while industry was limited, and there was a heavy reliance on exporting primary goods while importing capital and manufactured goods. Under Kenyatta, the structure of this economy did not fundamentally change, remaining externally oriented and dominated by multinational corporations and foreign capital. Kenyatta's economic policy was capitalist and entrepreneurial with no serious socialist policies being pursued, its focus was on achieving economic growth as opposed to equitable redistribution. The government passed laws to encourage foreign investment, recognizing that Kenya needed foreign trained specialists in scientific and technical fields to aid its economic development. Under Kenyatta, Western companies regarded Kenya as a safe and profitable place for investment. Between 1964 and 1970, large-scale foreign investment and in industry in Kenya nearly doubled. In contrast to his economic policies, Kenyatta publicly claimed he would create a democratic socialist state with an equitable distribution of economic and social development. In 1965, when Thomas Mboya was Minister for Economic Planning and Development, the government issued a session paper titled African Socialism and its Application to Planning in Kenya, in which it officially declared its commitment to what it called an African Socialist Economic Model. The session proposed a mixed economy with an important role for private capital, with Kenyatta's government specifying that it would only consider nationalization in instances where national security was at risk. Left-wing critics highlighted that the image of African socialism portrayed in the document provided for no major shift away from the colonial economy. Kenya's agricultural and industrial sectors were dominated by Europeans and its commerce and trade by Asians. One of Kenyatta's most pressing issues was to bring the economy under indigenous control. There was growing black resentment towards the Asian domination of the small business sector with Kenyatta's government putting pressure on Asian-owned businesses, intending to replace them with African-owned counterparts. The 1965 session paper promised an Africanization of the Kenyan economy, with the government increasingly pushing for black capitalism. The government established the Industrial and Commercial Development Corporation to provide loans for black-owned businesses, and secured a 51% share in the Kenyan National Assurance Company. In 1965, the government established the Kenya National Trading Corporation to ensure indigenous control over the trade in essential commodities, while the Trade Licensing Act of 1967 prohibited non-citizens from involvement in the rice, sugar, and maize trade. During the 1970s, this expanded to cover the trade in soap, cement, and textiles. 353. Many Asians who had retained British citizenship were affected by these measures. Between late 1967 and early 1968, growing numbers of Kenyan Asians migrated to Britain. In February 1968 large numbers migrated quickly before a legal change revoked their right to do so. Kenyatta was not sympathetic to those leaving. Kenya's identity as an African country is not going to be altered by the whims and malaises of groups of uncommitted individuals. Under Kenyatta, corruption became widespread throughout the government, civil service, and business community. Kenyatta and his family were tied up with this corruption as they enriched themselves through the mass purchase of property after 1963. Their acquisitions in the Central, Rift Valley, and coast provinces arouse great anger among landless Kenyans. His family used his presidential position to circumvent legal or administrative obstacles to acquiring property. The Kenyatta family also heavily invested in the coastal hotel business, Kenyatta personally owning the Leonard Beach Hotel. Other businesses they were involved with included Ruby Mining in Savo National Park, the casino business, the charcoal trade, which was causing significant deforestation, and the ivory trade. The Kenyan press, which was largely loyal to Kenyatta, did not delve into this issue, 
it was only after his death that publications appeared revealing the scale of his personal enrichment. Kenyan corruption and Kenyatta's role in it was better known in Britain, although many of his British friends, including MacDonald and Brockway, chose to believe Kenyatta was not personally involved. Land, Healthcare, and Education Reform The question of land ownership had deep emotional resonance in Kenya, having been a major grievance against the British colonialists. As part of the Lancaster House negotiations, Britain's government agreed to provide Kenya with 27 million euros with which to buy out white farmers and redistribute their land among the indigenous population. To ease this transition, Kenyatta made McKinsey, a white farmer, the Minister of Agriculture and Land. Kenyatta's government encouraged the establishment of private land buying companies that were often headed by prominent politicians. The government sold or leased lands in the former White Highlands to these companies, which in turn subdivided them among individual shareholders. In this way, the land redistribution programs favored the ruling party's chief constituency. Kenyatta himself expanded the land that he owned around Gate Tundu. Kenyans who made claims to land on the basis of ancestral ownership often found the land given to other people, including Kenyans from different parts of the country. Voices began to condemn the redistribution. In 1969, the MP Jean Marie Sereny censured the sale of historically Nandi lands in the rift to Non Nandi, describing the settlement schemes as Kenyatta's colonization of the rift. In part fueled by high rural unemployment, Kenya witnessed growing the rural to urban migration under Kenyatta's government. This exacerbated urban unemployment and housing shortages with squatter settlements and slums growing up and urban crime rates rising. Kenyatta was concerned by this, and promoted the reversal of this rural to urban migration, but in this was unsuccessful. Kenyatta's government was eager to control the country's trade unions, fearing their ability to disrupt the economy. To this end it emphasized social welfare schemes over traditional industrial institutions and in 1965 transformed the Kenya Federation of Labor into the Central Organization of Trade CAT, a body which came under strong government influence. No strikes could be legally carried out in Kenya without CAT's permission. There were also measures to Africanize the civil service, which by mid-1967 had become 91% African. During the 1960s and 1970s the public sector grew faster than the private sector. The growth in the public sector contributed to the significant expansion of the indigenous middle class in Kenyatta's Kenya. The government oversaw a massive expansion in education facilities. In June 1963, Kenyatta ordered the Amenda Commission to determine a framework for meeting Kenya's educational needs. Their report set out the long-term goal of universal free primary education in Kenya but argued that the government's emphasis should be on secondary and higher education to facilitate the training of indigenous African personnel to take over the civil service and other jobs requiring such an education. Between 1964 and 1966, the number of primary schools grew by 11.6%, and the number of secondary schools by 80%. By the time of Kenyatta's death, Kenya's first universities, the University of Nairobi and Kenyatta University, had been established. Although Kenyatta died without having attained the goal of free, universal primary education in Kenya, the country had made significant advances in that direction, with 85% of Kenyan children in primary education, and within a decade of independence had trained sufficient numbers of indigenous Africans to take over the civil service. Another priority for Kenyatta's government was improving access to healthcare services. It stated that its long-term goal was to establish a system of free, universal medical care. In the short term, its emphasis was on increasing the overall number of doctors and registered nurses while decreasing the number of expatriates in those positions. In 1965, the government introduced free medical services for outpatients and children. By Kenyatta's death, the majority of Kenyans had access to significantly better healthcare than they had had in the colonial period. Before independence, the average life expectancy in Kenya was 45, but by the end of the 1970s it was 55, the second highest in sub-Saharan Africa. 
this improved medical care had resulted in declining mortality rates while birth rates remained high, resulting in a rapidly growing population. From 1962 to 1979, Kenya's population grew by just under 4% a year, the highest rate in the world at the time. This put a severe strain on social services. Kenya's government promoted family planning projects to stem the birth rate, but these had little success. Foreign Policy In part due to his advanced years, Kenyatta rarely traveled outside of Eastern Africa. Under Kenyatta, Kenya was largely uninvolved in the affairs of other states, including those in the East African community. Despite his reservations about any immediate East African Federation, in June 1967 Kenyatta signed the Treaty for East African Cooperation. In December he attended a meeting with Tanzanian and Ugandan representatives to form the East African Economic Community, reflecting Kenyatta's cautious approach toward regional integration. He also took on a mediating role during the Congo Crisis, heading the Organization of African Unity's Conciliation Commission on the Congo. Facing the pressures of the Cold War, Kenyatta officially pursued a policy of positive non-alignment. In reality, his foreign policy was pro-Western and in particular pro-British. Kenya became a member of the British Commonwealth, using this as a vehicle to put pressure on the white minority apartheid regimes in South Africa and Rhodesia. Britain remained one of Kenya's foremost sources of foreign trade, British aid to Kenya was among the highest in Africa. In 1964, Kenya and the UK signed a Memorandum of Understanding, one of only two military alliances Kenyatta's government made, the British Special Air Service trained Kenyatta's own bodyguards. Commentators argued that Britain's relationship with Kenyatta's Kenya was a neo-colonial one, with the British having exchanged their position of political power for one of influence. The historian Poppy Cullen nevertheless noted that there was no dictatorial neo-colonial control in Kenyatta's Kenya. Although many white Kenyans accepted Kenyatta's rule, he remained opposed by white far-right activists, while in London at the July 1964 Commonwealth Conference, he was assaulted by Martin Webster, a British neo-Nazi. Kenyatta's relationship with the United States was also warm. The United States Agency for International Development played a key role in helping respond to a maize shortage in Kambaland in 1965. Kenyatta also maintained a warm relationship with Israel, including when other East African nations endorsed Arab hostility to the state, he for instance permitted Israeli jets to refuel in Kenyan on their way back from the Entebbe raid. In turn, in 1976 the Israelis warned of a plot by the Palestinian Liberation Army to assassinate him, a threat he took seriously. Kenyatta and his government were anti-communist, and in June 1965 he warned that it is naive to think that there is no danger of imperialism from the East. In world power politics the East has as much designs upon us as the West and would like to serve their own interests. That is why we reject communism. His governance was often criticized by communists and other leftists, some of whom accused him of being a fascist. When Chinese communist official Zhuan Lai visited Dar es Salaam, his statement that Africa is ripe for revolution was clearly aimed largely at Kenya. In 1964, Kenyatta impounded a secret shipment of Chinese armaments that passed through Kenyan territory on its way to Uganda. Oboe personally visited Kenyatta to apologize. In June 1967, Kenyatta declared the Chinese charged affairs persona non grata in Kenya and recalled the Kenyan ambassador from Peking. Relations with the Soviet Union were also strained. Kenyatta shut down the Lumumba Institute, an educational organization named after the Congolese independence leader Patrice Lumumba, on the basis that it was a front for Soviet influence in Kenya. Dissent in the One Party State Kenyatta made clear his desire for Kenya to become a one party state, regarding this as a better expression of national unity than a multi party system. In the first five years of independence, he consolidated control of the central government, removing the autonomy of Kenya's provinces to prevent the entrenchment of ethnic power bases. 
he argued that centralized control of the government was needed to deal with the growth in demands for local services and to assist quicker economic development. In 1966, it launched a commission to examine reforms to local government operations, and in 1969 passed the Transfer of Functions Act, which terminated grants to local authorities and transferred major services from provincial to central control. A major focus for Kenyatta during the first three and a half years of Kenya's independence were the divisions within Kenya itself. Opposition to Kenyatta's government grew, particularly following the assassination of Hayo Pindo in February 1965. Kenyatta condemned the assassination of the prominent leftist politician, although UK intelligence agencies believed that his own bodyguard had orchestrated the murder. Relations between Kenyatta and Odinga were strained, and at the March 1966 party conference, Odinga's post, that of party vice president, was divided among eight different politicians, greatly limiting his power and ending his position as Kenyatta's automatic successor. Between 1964 and 1966, Kenyatta and other Kenya conservatives had been deliberately trying to push Odinga to resign from the party. Under growing pressure, in 1966 Odinga stepped down as state vice president, claiming that Kenya had failed to achieve economic independence and needed to adopt socialist policies. Backed by several other senior Kenya figures and trade unionists, he became head of the new Kenya People's Union KPU. In its manifesto, the KPU stated that it would pursue truly socialist policies like the nationalization of public utilities. It claimed Kenyatta's government wanted, to build a capitalist system in the image of Western capitalism but are too embarrassed or dishonest to call it that. The KPU were legally recognized as the official opposition, thus restoring the country's two-party system. The new party was a direct challenge to Kenyatta's rule, and he regarded it as a communist-inspired plot to oust him. Soon after the KPU's creation, the Kenyan parliament amended the constitution to ensure that the defectors, who had originally been elected on the Kenyu ticket, could not automatically retain their seats and would have to stand for re-election. This resulted in the election of June 1966. The Luo increasingly rallied around the KPU, which experienced localized violence that hindered its ability to campaign, although Kenyatta's government officially disavowed this violence. Can you retain the support of all national newspapers and the government-owned radio and television stations? Of the 29 defectors, only 9 were re-elected on the KPU ticket, Odinga was among them, having retained his central Nyanza seat with a high majority. Odinga was replaced as vice president by Joseph Moore Rumby, who in turn would be replaced by Moi. In July 1969, Mboya, a prominent and popular Lowell Kanyu politician, was assassinated by a Kikuyu. 431, Kenyatta had reportedly been concerned that Mboya, with U.S. backing, could remove him from the presidency, and across Kenya there were suspicions voiced that Kenyatta's government was responsible for Mboya's death. The killing sparked tensions between the Kikuyu and other ethnic groups across the country, with riots breaking out in Nairobi. In October 1969, Kenyatta visited Kisamu, located in Molo territory, to open her hospital. On being greeted by a crowd shouting KPU slogans, he lost his temper. When members of the crowd started throwing stones, Kenyatta's bodyguards opened fire on them, killing and wounding several. In response to the rise of KPU, Kenyatta had introduced Hoding, a Kikuyu cultural tradition in which individuals came to Gaetandu to swear their loyalty to him. Journalists were discouraged from reporting on the oathing system, and several were deported when they tried to do so. Many Kenyans were pressured or forced to swear oaths, something condemned by the country's Christian establishment. In response to the growing condemnation, the oathing was terminated in September 1969, 438 and Kenyatta invited leaders from other ethnic groups to a meeting in Gate Tundu. Kenyatta's government resorted to undemocratic measures to restrict the opposition. It used laws on detention and deportation to perpetuate its political hold. In 1966, it passed the Public Security, Detained and Restricted Persons, regulations, allowing the authorities to arrest and detain anyone for the preservation of public security without putting them on trial. 
In October 1969 the government banned the KPU, and arrested Odinga before putting him under indefinite detainment. With the organized opposition eliminated, from 1969, Kenya was once again a de facto one-party state. The December 1969 general election, in which all candidates were from the ruling Kenya, resulted in Kenya's government remaining in power, but many members of his government lost their parliamentary seats to rivals from within the party. Over coming years, many other political and intellectual figures considered hostile to Kenyatta's rule were detained or imprisoned, including Sereni, Flamina Chialagat, George Inona, Martin Chikaku, and Guy Wathingo. Other political figures who were critical of Kenyatta's administration, including Ronald Ngala and Josiah Mwangi Kariuki, were killed in incidents that many speculated were government assassinations. Political ideology Kenyatta possessed a common touch and great leadership qualities. He was essentially a moderate trying to achieve the radical revolution of a nationalist victory in a colonialist society, and his ambivalence over many issues can best be explained by his need to contain or use his militants, and he had plenty of them. They were impatient and wanted to see effective action. Kenyatta certainly knew how to appeal to African sentiments. Kenyatta biographer Guy Arnold Views on Pan-Africanism and Socialism While in Britain, Kenyatta made political alliances with individuals committed to Marxism and to radical Pan-Africanism, the idea that African countries should politically unify. Some commentators have posthumously characterized Kenyatta as a Pan-Africanist. Maloba observed that during the colonial period Kenyatta had embraced radical Pan-African activism that differed sharply from the deliberate conservative positions, especially on the question of African liberation that he espoused while Kenya's leader. As leader of Kenya, Kenyatta published two collected volumes of his speeches, Harambe and Suffering Without Bitterness. The material included in these publications was carefully selected so as to avoid mention of the radicalism he exhibited while in Britain during the 1930s. Kenyatta had been exposed to Marxist-Leninist ideas through his friendship with Padmore and the time spent in the Soviet Union, but had also been exposed to Western forms of liberal democratic government through his many years in Britain. He appears to have had no further involvement with the communist movement after 1934. As Kenya's leader, Kenyatta rejected the idea that Marxism offered a useful framework for analyzing his country's socio-economic situation. The academics Bruce J. Berman and John M. Lonsdale argue that Marxist frameworks for analyzing society influenced some of his beliefs, such as his view that British colonialism had to be destroyed rather than simply reformed. Kenyatta nevertheless disagreed with the Marxist attitude that tribalism was backward and retrograde. His positive attitude toward tribal society frustrated some of Kenyatta's Marxist Pan Africanist friends in Britain, among them Padmore, James, and Rasti McCunnan, who regarded it as parochial and unprogressive. Asensa suggested that Kenyatta initially had socialist inclinations but became a victim of capitalist circumstances. Conversely, Savage stated that Kenyatta's direction was hardly towards the creation of a radical new socialist society, and Mochian called him an African capitalist. When in power, Kenyatta displayed a preoccupation with individual and Mbari land rights that were at odds with any socialist-oriented collectivization. According to Maloba, Kenyatta's government sought to project capitalism as an African ideology, and communism, or socialism, as alien and dangerous. Legacy. Within Kenya, Kenyatta came to be regarded as the father of the nation, and was given the unofficial title of Mzi, a Swahili term meaning Grand Old Man. From 1963 until his death, a cult of personality surrounded him in the country, one which deliberately interlinked Kenyan nationalism with Kenyatta's own personality. This use of Kenyatta as a popular symbol of the nation itself was furthered by the similarities between their names. He came to be regarded as a father figure not only by Kikuyu and Kenyans, but by Africans more widely. After 1963, Miloba noted, Kenyatta became about the most admired post-independence African leader on the world stage, 
one who Western countries held as a beloved elder statesman. His opinions were most valued by both conservative African politicians and Western leaders. On becoming Kenya's leader, his anti-communist positions gained favor in the West, and some pro-Western governments gave him awards. In 1965 he, for instance, received medals from both Pope Paul VI and the South Korean government. In 1974, Arnold referred to Kenyatta as one of the outstanding African leaders now living, someone who had become synonymous with Kenya. He added that Kenyatta had been one of the shrewdest politicians on the continent, regarded as one of the great architects of African nationalist achievements since 1945 inches. Kenneth Onyangno characterized him as one of the greatest men of the 20th century, having been a beacon, a rallying point for suffering Kenyans to fight for their rights, justice and freedom whose brilliance gave strength and aspiration to people beyond the boundaries of Kenya. In 2018, Maloba described him as one of the legendary pioneers of modern African nationalism. In their examination of his writings, Berman and Lonsdale described him as a pioneer for being one of the very first Kikuyu to write and publish, his representational achievement was unique. Illness and Death For many years, Kenyatta had suffered health problems. He had a mild stroke in 1966, and a second in May 1968. He suffered from gout and heart problems, all of which he sought to keep hidden from the public. By 1970, he was increasingly feeble and senile, and by 1975 Kenyatta had, according to Maloba, in effect ceased to actively govern. Four Kikuyu politicians, Koi Inang, James Jicharu, Njoro Dmungai, and Charles Njinjo, formed his inner circle of associates, and he was rarely seen in public without one of them present. This clique faced opposition from Kenya backbenchers spearheaded by Kari Uki. In March 1975, he was kidnapped, tortured, and murdered, and his body dumped in the Ngong Hills. After Kari Aku's murder, Miloba noted, there was a noticeable erosion of support for Kenyatta and his government. Thenceforth, when the president spoke to crowds, they no longer applauded his statements. In 1977, Kenyatta had several further strokes or heart attacks. On August 22, 1978, he died of a heart attack in the State House, Mombasa. The Kenyan government had been preparing for Kenyatta's death since at least his 1968 stroke. It had requested British assistance in organizing his state funeral as a result of the UK's long-standing experience in this area. Mackenzie had been employed as a go-between, and the structure of the funeral was orchestrated to deliberately imitate that of deceased British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. In doing so, senior Kenyans sought to project an image of their country as a modern nation-state rather than one incumbent on tradition. The funeral took place at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, six days after Kenyatta's death. Britain's heir to the throne, Charles, Prince of Wales, attended the event, a symbol of the value that the British government perceived in its relationship with Kenya. African heads of state also attended, including Nairir, Idamine, Kenneth Konda, and Hastings Benda, as did India's Murjide Sa'i and Pakistan's Muhammad Zia al Haq. His body was buried in a mausoleum in the parliament grounds. Kenyatta's succession had been an issue of debate since independence, and Kenyatta had not unreservedly nominated a successor. The Kikuyu clique surrounding him had sought to amend the constitution to prevent Vice President Ma, who was from the Kalenjin people rather than the Kikuyu, from automatically becoming acting president, but their attempts failed amid sustained popular and parliamentary opposition. After Kenyatta's death, the transition of power proved smooth, surprising many international commentators. As vice president, Moi was sworn in as acting president for a 90-day interim period. In October he was unanimously elected Kenya president and subsequently declared president of Kenya itself. Moi emphasized his loyalty to Kenyatta, I followed and was faithful to him until his last day even when his closest friends forsook him and there was much expectation that he would continue the policies inaugurated by Kenyatta. He nevertheless criticized the corruption, land grabbing, 
and capitalistic ethos that had characterized Kenyatta's period and expressed populist tendencies by emphasizing a closer link to the poor. In 1982 he would amend the Kenyan constitution to create a jury one-party state. Legacy. Within Kenya, Kenyatta came to be regarded as the father of the nation, and was given the unofficial title of MC, a Swahili term meaning Grand Old Man. From 1963 until his death, a cult of personality surrounded him in the country, one which deliberately interlinked Kenyan nationalism with Kenyatta's own personality. This use of Kenyatta as a popular symbol of the nation itself was furthered by the similarities between their names. He came to be regarded as a father figure not only by Kikuyu and Kenyans, but by Africans more widely. After 1963, Miloba noted, Kenyatta became about the most admired post-independence African leader on the world stage, one who Western countries held as a beloved elder statesman. His opinions were most valued by both conservative African politicians and Western leaders. On becoming Kenya's leader, his anti-communist positions gained favor in the West, and some pro-Western governments gave him awards. In 1965 he, for instance, received medals from both Pope Paul VI and the South Korean government. In 1974, Arnold referred to Kenyatta as one of the outstanding African leaders now living, someone who had become synonymous with Kenya. He added that Kenyatta had been one of the shrewdest politicians on the continent, regarded as one of the great architects of African nationalist achievements since 1945 inches. Kenneth Onyanchno characterized him as one of the greatest men of the 20th century, having been a beacon, a rallying point for suffering Kenyans to fight for their rights, justice and freedom whose brilliance gave strength and aspiration to people beyond the boundaries of Kenya. In 2018, Maloba described him as one of the legendary pioneers of modern African nationalism. In their examination of his writings, Berman and Lonsdale described him as a pioneer for being one of the very first Kikuyu to write and publish. His representational achievement was unique. illness and death. For many years, Kenyatta had suffered health problems. He had a mild stroke in 1966, and a second in May 1968. He suffered from gout and heart problems, all of which he sought to keep hidden from the public. By 1970, he was increasingly feeble and senile, and by 1975 Kenyatta had, according to Maloba, in effect ceased to actively govern. Four Kikuyu politicians, Koi Inang, James Jicharu, Njoro Dmungai, and Charles Nshinjo, formed his inner circle of associates, and he was rarely seen in public without one of them present. This clique faced opposition from Kenya backbenchers spearheaded by Kari Uki. In March 1975, he was kidnapped, tortured, and murdered, and his body dumped in the Ngong Hills. After Kari Uku's murder, Miloba noted, there was a noticeable erosion of support for Kenyatta and his government. Thenceforth, when the president spoke to crowds, they no longer applauded his statements. In 1977, Kenyatta had several further strokes or heart attacks. On August 22, 1978, he died of a heart attack in the State House, Mombasa. The Kenyan government had been preparing for Kenyatta's death since at least his 1968 stroke. It had requested British assistance in organizing his state funeral as a result of the UK's long-standing experience in this area. Mackenzie had been employed as a go-between, and the structure of the funeral was orchestrated to deliberately imitate that of deceased British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. In doing so, senior Kenyans sought to project an image of their country as a modern nation-state rather than one incumbent on tradition. The funeral took place at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, six days after Kenyatta's death. Britain's heir to the throne, Charles, Prince of Wales, attended the event, a symbol of the value that the British government perceived in its relationship with Kenya. African heads of state also attended, including Nairere, Idamine, Kenneth Konda, and Hastings Benda, 
as did India's Murjide Sa'i and Pakistan's Muhammad Zia al Haq. His body was buried in a mausoleum in the parliament grounds. Kenyatta's succession had been an issue of debate since independence, and Kenyatta had not unreservedly nominated a successor. The Kikuyu clique surrounding him had sought to amend the constitution to prevent Vice President Ma, who was from the Kalenjin people rather than the Kikuyu, from automatically becoming acting president, but their attempts failed amid sustained popular and parliamentary opposition. After Kenyatta's death, the transition of power proved smooth, surprising many international commentators. As Vice President, Ma was sworn in as acting president for a 90-day interim period. In October he was unanimously elected Kenya president and subsequently declared president of Kenya itself. Mwa emphasized his loyalty to Kenyatta, I followed and was faithful to him until his last day, even when his closest friends forsook him and there was much expectation that he would continue the policies inaugurated by Kenyatta. He nevertheless criticized the corruption, land grabbing, and capitalistic ethos that had characterized Kenyatta's period and expressed populist tendencies by emphasizing a closer link to the poor. In 1982 he would amend the Kenyan constitution to create a jury one-party state, 